beloved flock of God, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Please be seated. It is a true privilege to come together with you on this day of the Lord's resurrection, as every Sunday is, and to experience the power of God. That praise song we just offered up across the screen and in our hearts, we talked about the power of God. And that's the heart of this message this morning. I never get involved in the hymn choices, by the way, at any service, because I like to see how the Holy Spirit is going to give me a word for the day and how the entire team is in the same step with the Spirit. And here we're already off to a great start with that, aren't we? The power of God. Back in 1888, it was just an ordinary day for a man named Alfred Nobel. I mean, he was no ordinary man. He was a Swedish chemist, uh, an entrepreneur, a committed pacifist, and an inventor. He invented something called dynamite. He thought it would end all wars. Can you believe that? But it had the opposite effect, and that was troubling to him. His brother Ludwig had just died, but it was an ordinary breakfast for him as he was at the table, and someone brought him a French newspaper, and he opened it up, and it was an obituary, but it wasn't about his brother Ludwig, it was about him. It said, merchant of death is dead. He dropped the newspaper, shocked. What kind of epitaph would this be for his life's work? He knew he had to make a change. And so, to the shock of his family and friends, he left 94% of his wealth at the end of his life to the establishment of a series of prizes that would recognize those that had done significant work for humanity the year prior. We know these today as, of course, the Nobel Prizes for Peace. That word dynamite in English finds its source in a Greek word called dunamis. It means power. Dunamis occurs 117 times across the pages of the New Testament. It does not refer to the power of destruction. Instead, it refers to God's power to heal and recreate. Nobel essentially tapped into that, didn't he? Because he took his life's work and he shifted it toward the path of healing and recreation, not destruction. As we look at the dunamis power of God throughout the Bible and in the life of Jesus, what do we see? Jesus is baptized in the River Jordan. He receives the Spirit of God. And immediately he goes into the wilderness where he is there for 40 days and 40 nights fasting and he's tempted by the devil. And in the three temptations he faces, according to Matthew's gospel, the final and perhaps the most significant one is where the devil takes Jesus and he shows him all the kingdoms of the world and he says, I rule these, I will give them to you if you do but one thing, fall down and worship me. Jesus says, get away from me, Satan. He quotes his own Bible from the Torah and says this, worship the Lord your God and him alone. The devil flees him, and we're told that angels come and minister to Jesus. Two days ago, in the church calendar, we recognized a day called the Feast Day of St. Michael and All Angels, and so it seems appropriate to recognize the presence of angels as well when we talk about the power of God. So these angels are ministering to Jesus. They're strengthening him, just as angels strengthen us as we make this walk of faith. In fact, in Matthew chapter 18, we have the text which tells us about that concept of a guardian angel for children. Jesus says about the little ones, their angel beholds the Father's face in heaven all the time. And so we can trust that there are angels around all of us, our children, entirely swept up in the love of God especially. So Jesus goes from there to begin his ministry. He goes to his hometown synagogue. He unrolls the scroll of the prophet Isaiah, and he says this as a prophecy that he is fulfilling. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me to bind up the brokenhearted, to set free those that are captive, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. This is the power of God in Jesus. 
fulfilling all prophecy as God's Messiah. Jesus begins his ministry. He is soon opening the eyes of the blind. He is healing those who are ill. He is raising the dead. His disciples see the dunamis power of God, and they behold it with wonder and awe, and perhaps a little fear. At one point, Jesus is walking through a thick crowd of people. They're all pressing upon him. There's a woman who's been ill for a very long time. She could never find a cure for her disease. She reaches out. She touches just the hem of his garment, and she's instantly healed. And what does Jesus say? Who touched me? I felt power, dudamus, go out from me. Jesus knew he was filled with the dunamis power of God, not for destruction, but for healing, for recreation, to make all things new. As we go to the end of Jesus' earthly ministry, he's in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's facing the cross. The soldiers show up to arrest him, and one of Jesus' companions, thinking of worldly power, pulls out a sword to defend Jesus, and Jesus says, put your sword away. For those who live by the sword will die by the sword. Did you not know that I could call upon my Father and he would send me 70,000 angels? They're the angels again. And they would fight. But how then would the scripture be fulfilled? The scripture that says that the Son of Man must suffer and empty himself of all earthly, worldly power. Oh, he could have had it. The devil knew that when he tempted him. Otherwise, why would he tempt him? We now look at our epistle for this morning, Philippians chapter 2. This, by the way, was taken and made into a hymn in the early church. It's called, historically, the canonic hymn. The earliest Christians would sing this together. The words that go like this, Though he was in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself taking the form of a servant, being born in human likeness, even going to the cross. Now, this is not a Greek class, but I'll tell you one more word. Kenosis, it means emptying. That's why it's called the canonic prayer or the canonic hymn. This is the song about what it means for the Son of God to empty himself for us. Jesus, after his resurrection, and right before his ascension, he looked at his disciples, and he said, stay here in Jerusalem until you receive power from on high, until you're clothed with dunamis power. In other words, the same power that Jesus was filled with, which brought healing and recreation, he promises it to us. And so we might ask, we want it, Lord, but how do we get it? How can we be filled with your dunamis power? It comes through the Holy Spirit as we open our minds and our hearts and our hands and ask for God's dunamis power. He promises to give it. It has everything to do with having the same mind that was in Christ Jesus, again, back to our epistle, that though he was in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited. We have to look at ourselves in moments like this and wonder where it is that we are grasping onto things, including power, prestige, and possessions. Those are the three areas that Jesus targeted when he calls his own to transformation. Power, prestige, and possessions. We have to look at those if we would take up our cross and follow Jesus. It's not easy. This is why we call it the cost of discipleship. A number of years ago, I was in Tanzania with my son, who was 11 at the time, We were cruising across the African bush in a Land Rover. We pulled over after being in that vehicle for a long time. It was hot, we needed to stretch, we got out, and no sooner had we gotten out of that vehicle than seemingly out of nowhere, a family of olive baboons came out of the bushes and ran toward the vehicle, the young ones jumping on the hood, and they started to go through the sunroof to take some things. Namely, our lunch, a Coleman cooler, Now, we didn't know it at the time, but olive baboons are carnivores, and they've got huge fangs. They're frightening creatures. But in the moment, when you're protecting your stuff, 
you'd be amazed what you can do. So we managed to scare them off, and we got back in the car, and we drove back to the village. And I said to the village elder, you wouldn't believe what happened today. He said, oh, I believe it. We deal with those baboons all the time. Do you want to know how we get rid of them? I said, sure. He said, come with me. And he showed me a gourd, which had a very big base and a very narrow neck. And he said, you may not know this, but baboons, they love colorful marbles. I said, what, do they eat them? No, no, no. They like to collect them. And so he said, what we do is we put marbles around the ground when they come into the village, and then we put a bunch in that gourd. And what happens is they find them in there, and they grab a whole handful of marbles, and then they're stuck. All they have to do is release their grip on the marbles, but they can't do it. And so they fight the gourd the whole time, and they're so distracted. We come along, and we put a net over them, and someone humanely takes them away, a professional, into the bush. You see, they're not free because they can't let go of the things they want. Those colorful, shiny objects, which are just marbles, they lose their freedom. You know, we all deal with holding on to things too tightly. It might be power, it might be prestige, it might be possessions. And the invitation for all of us is to have the same mind that was in Christ Jesus, that though he could have had all kinds of worldly power and things, he was able to open his hands up to the point of death upon the cross, where those outstretched hands and arms of love embrace the whole world. And so Jesus calls us to loosen our grip, doesn't he? To think about, among other things, our legacies. What our life will be known for what our life will be like in the life to come based upon how much of a grip we had and how much of a release by the grace of God we were able to offer the Lord in this world that longs for the Savior's touch. Because we can't touch the next generation if our hands are clenched in our own concerns. When Jesus stood up in that hometown synagogue and said, I have come to proclaim release to the captives, he was talking about all of us those of us that he wants to have dunamis power, the power to love and the power to heal and the power to recreate in this generation. And so may he work in us in such a way that we can start to let go and let God to release that which ultimately belongs to the Lord, to give it all to him and to think about what it means to live the lives we've been given, gifts, gifts to God, gifts to this world. As we say, Lord, give us your dunamis power and not a love for power, but instead a power for your love. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.